After all that social face-to-face -face excitement, Hi, I'm Sophie Brendel. I'm the head of digital comms at the BBC. Uh, thank you all so much for coming along tonight for what should be an absolutely fantastic session. And um, before I hand over to Roger Mosey, the director of London 2012 at the BBC, to introduce our absolutely fantastic panel tonight, just a couple of quick words of housekeeping. Uh, there is Wi-Fi here. There are signs on the walls with the access codes in case you haven't spied them. Um, the hashtag for tonight is SMWBBC, and throughout the session we'll have your tweets in the background, so don't be rude. Uh, we are live streaming. Hello, everybody who's watching. Um, and the live stream and the video of it will be available, I believe, uh, from tomorrow onwards for all of your friends who couldn't see it tonight and for all of you who are writing and blogging about it, should you wish to embed it. Um, and afterwards, if any of you would like to join some of us for a drink, we'll be in the pub next door in the Marquis of Anglesey, so please do come along for a drink. Uh, but without further ado, I will hand you over to Roger to take the panel on. And oh, sorry. I forgot one crucial thing. Before I hand you over to Roger, and just to get you in the mood. Ten strokes, ten of the biggest strokes of your life in the British group. Mark Hunter, Zach Purchase are scudding up to the line. And how can Greece and Denmark come back? But surely they have left it too late. And they have. And we have now gone into the record book for Great Britain are the Olympic champions. And it sounds Fantastic. Oh, that's fabulous, fabulous news, fabulous victory. The first silver medalists, Nathan Robertson and Gail Evans. They were four points away from the gold, but theirs is still a tremendous achievement. Wonderful reception from a huge British crowd and everybody else for that matter. And I'll now hand you over to Roger. Right, thanks everybody. Um, a distinguished panel. I'll introduce them properly in a moment or two. Um, I should say um, thank you to Lewis, who got me to go on Twitter about uh, eight or nine months ago. So I'm now at Roger Mosey on Twitter, and I found it horribly addictive. So actually, the social media, which I've always been a, a, quite a keen blogger, and I got into Facebook relatively early, but Twitter has kind of, I think, completed my social media education. So it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I was just going to spend a minute or so saying what the BBC is doing in 2012, because um, clearly it's the biggest thing we have ever done. And it's not just about the Olympic Games, but if you think about this year with, uh, or last year with the Royal Wedding, that was just one incredible day. We've got three days this year of the Diamond Jubilee, which is going to be huge. Uh, we've got 70 days of the Torch Relay. We've got 80 days of the London 2012 Festival, the biggest cultural festival in our lifetimes. And then the small matter of 17 days of the Olympic Games with 26 sports all having effectively their world championships. I mean, to do that, um, a lot of our activity obviously on BBC One and BBC Three. Uh, we'll also have a new radio station, Five Live Sports Extra Extra covering the Olympics. But then there's a big innovation story this year, uh, a lot of which is planned, obviously. So uh, 24 simultaneous live HD streams coming in at peak, and the pledge that you'll be able to see every event from first thing at the morning through to last thing at night. That's the first time we've ever offered that. Um, yesterday, we announced that we were doing um, 3D, so it'll be 3D for the opening ceremony, the closing ceremony, the 100 metres final, and nightly highlights. Uh, we're also doing super high vision, that's 16 times the quality of high definition. Uh, you'll be able to see that, you'll be able to get tickets to go and see it at Broadcasting House in London, at Pacific Key in Glasgow, and at the National Media Museum in Bradford. So all that's a kind of planned innovation story. But I think social media is probably the bit of it that we don't quite know how it's going to work, because um, especially with Twitter and, and sort of instant social networking, this is the first Olympics where it's really been a powerful force. And one of the things we want to do tonight is just explore what that could look like and the kind of challenges for the organisers, for the broadcasters and for the athletes. And uh, we have here a, a distinguished panel who are very keen indeed on social media. And I was just saying to Zach, I looked at his website today, which if you haven't seen it, is a, a really kind of state-of-the-art whizzy website and um, uh, lots of tweets from everybody on this panel. So let me now um, introduce them. And the general idea will be that I'm going to ask some questions and provoke and needle a bit. Um, you can then join in, and the whole thing is designed to be, um, as the current fashion is, uh, interactive. 
So we have with us uh, three Olympic medalists and three MBEs. Um, I think those do overlap, as well as some uh, BBC faces. Uh, star rowers Mark Hunter and Zach Purchase, the reigning world and Olympic champions in lightweight double skulls. They won gold in Beijing in 2008, and they're going to defend that in London this year, or more, uh, more accurately, I suppose, at Windsor. And at last year's World Rowing Championships, they successfully defended their world title. Um, Gail Ems is a former World and Commonwealth Badminton Champion and we saw their Olympic silver medalist uh, with Nathan Robertson. Uh, she won gold at the 2006 Commonwealth Games and silver at those Athens Olympics. And Gail is now a broadcaster for BBC TV and radio and in a bit of stereotyping will be doing badminton for us in London 2012. Um, James Pierce is a BBC Sports News correspondent who's reported from every major sporting event from the BBC. And um, it, uh, at the risk of making James blush, I think his Twitter reporting of the Harry Redknapp trial was actually extraordinary. I found it completely uh, gripping in the way that he told the story of that trial and showed the way now that you are allowed to use Twitter, sometimes in court, just what a powerful force it can be. And then Lewis Wiltshire is a former editor of the BBC Sport website. He's our social media editor, in which role he does persuade dull bureaucrats like me to go onto Twitter. Um, and in a few weeks, actually, he's going to be leaving the BBC to go to an organisation called, oh, Twitter. <laughs> so uh, there you go. So that's our panel. Right. Um, I have a first question, and whoever wants to take it uh, can do. So first off the marks. Charles Van Commony has said that Twitter is a place for clowns and attention seekers. Who would like to take that? <laughs> okay, Sam. Apparently, I get the, get the honour of answering that one. Um, I wouldn't disagree. Um, I certainly, I think it's a great opportunity for people to get out there and interact with people. Clowning around, yes, people do take it to the extreme sometimes. Attention seekers, yes, people do try and seek attention. But also, hidden amongst those idiotic tweets and irrelevant tweets, there are minuscule gems of information and... Hopefully that is where us guys who are on Twitter that are sitting here in front of you will try and put out the important and interesting information. Um, unfortunately, yes, you have to sift through it, but we do our very best not to clown. And not so to why, why, why do you invest as much as you obviously do in your website and the ability for people to follow you? For me, the, one, of the really, one of the really important things I think about what I do in terms of sport is just getting out there and, and encouraging people to be more active and healthier and live a better quality of life. Um, one of the ways that is really important is to make other people realise that it is possible to do absolutely anything they want. Um, by being really open and encouraging people to sort of follow what I'm doing and, and seeing how I go about things, it's, I think it's crucial to get out there and... and show people that, yes, I may be uh, going to the Olympics, and fingers crossed, depending on selection, um, going there and, and bring back some more gold medals, but, you know, I'm just an average guy. I have a normal life. I live with my other half at Mrs. Purchase to be. Um, yes, I know. I so, so, I mean, I, I've been looking through some of your tweets, actually. Uh, so you think that everyone here wants to know, having steak and chips tonight, they're with a healthy twist, Swede chips. We'll let you know how it goes. Should I have peppercorn or red wine sauce? <laughs> I think that's very informative. And actually, <laughs> it's very interactive because I then went, decided for a peppercorn sauce after a number of feedbacks saying that it would be much more tasty. And I have to confess, Swede chips, brilliant. Another variation last night with some Mexican wedges flavouring on them, just to make them that little bit more interesting. Really tasty. Just, just in the interest of fairness and balance, I've been looking at everyone's tweets. So could you put a uh, Gail? Um, I, 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 I should say I'm an Arsenal season ticket holder. So last night you were quote laughing at Arsenal, um, and you tweeted at one point. You tweeted at one point, "Lemon cake is done and dusted, as is Arsenal in the Champions League." Which is true. OK, um, but also, I mean, a bit ago, uh, on a Sunday morning around about 10 o'clock, uh, you tweeted, still in my pyjamas, lazy Sunday. Yeah, that was just a personal um, just comment. But, you know, I, I think for Zach, athletes, if we did actually, when I was an athlete, if I actually did tweet what I got up to, it's really boring. You know, you train, you eat, you sleep, you train, you eat, you sleep. <laughs> So it's just trying to make the life of an athlete and whatever you know you choose to go on. It's just trying to get a glimpse of that life. But you know now I'm a mum and I do other things as well. So yeah, you know I'm having a lazy Sunday today. I don't care. I want people to know that my life isn't all manic and stuff. I am just you know like a normal person as well. 
I'm going to bring Mark in in a second, but I want to go to James now. I mean, James, presumably you as a journalist want these people to tweet as much as possible and to give you stories. And a lot of them do, as we well know. I mean, they have more intelligence than one sitting alongside me than some of the, the footballers do who um, give us stories day in and, and day out. Uh, although I do think, I mean, for example, Rio Ferdinand, of course, everyone I'm sure here probably follows Rio Ferdinand. And I mean, he has changed his profile so well through the use of Twitter. And he now can, I mean, for example, when I mean, he was, he was tipping red now to be the next manager within an hour or so of Capello having been sacked or having left, um, I should say. Um, so, um, yeah, Twitter's given Rio, someone like Rio, so much more power. And, I mean, okay, these guys aren't so Rio level now, but they might be come as the, the, the first week in August. And everyone's going to want to know what you've got to say. And you finally have got the outlet to say it. So it's something which you, you couldn't possibly have had in, in Beijing four years ago. So all power to your elbow. So, so Mark, when, when you tweet, do you deliberately think I'm connecting with my audience as opposed to being filtered through journalists or through the media? Yeah, definitely. The, the last thing you think about really is like journalists or reporters looking at your tweets. Um, I tend not to talk about what I do as an athlete, as a rower, because rowing's pretty boring, to be honest. Um, to tell people what you're training is not very enjoyable to listen to, but to tell or explain what you're doing outside, the fun stuff that you get to do, um, the opportunities that have happened since become Olympic champion, you know, I would never have had before. So to go to different events or you know, go to football matches and be looked after, you know, I enjoy going to other sporting events. And whenever I go now, it's not just a case you get a ticket to go and sit there, you get to do enjoyable things before and after the game with the team or the manager. So, you know, it's changed the way that I can kind of put that across that, you know, there are some luxuries um, on the other side of being an athlete. Now, um, as I said, I trawl through everybody's tweets, and I'm going to come to um, one that Zach did in a moment or two, but from you, um, Nespresso coffee machine arrived, already looking forward to my morning cup. And then, wow, morning coffee was a treat today, and the froth milk was the perfect finish. Um, uh, do we need to know anything about you and Nespresso machines? Or? Probably not, but it was... Uh I suppose that's the, the nice thing about it is that you can talk about the new things that you get. Um, and over Christmas or New Year, I went away with someone that had one of those Nespresso machines and I was just blown away by it. I was like, I've got to get one of these. Um, and then I got it and the coffee is fantastic. Um, obviously, <laughs> tweeting about it, you're hoping that someone will read it from Nespresso and send you some free capsules. <laughs> I, I was going to say, because Zach, Zach mentioned healthy eating, um, your equivalent is uh, to at Whisper, ooh, that sounds good, only 15 minutes to go, I'm missing my Whisper gold. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the pudding after the steak. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean, do, do people want you to endorse products? Is that part of what, what happens? Uh, yes and no. I, I suppose if like you talk about something, then um, the product or people you know, producing that you know, might show an interest. Uh, we did a, a fun one. One of the guys, Bjorn Borg, the, the underwear, um, for a laugh, he went on Twitter, got them to send some underwear. We took a picture beside a swimming pool, and now he's pretty much got a lifetime supply of Bjorn pants uh, because we're all naked wearing them. Um, and you know, it's those things that can help. You know, your friends get free things and also yourself. So it's, it's quite good fun. Um, yeah, and there is the opportunity for sponsors. They do like you to mention the products that they give you, um, especially BMW. You like the car, they want you to tweet about that, or British Airways, you know, you're flying, you're in the lounge, and the benefits are going to the lounge and that sort of thing. So it does kind of add to that experience of what goes on behind the scenes. So, so Lewis, as you advocate social media in the BBC, it's all about athletes in pants and espresso machines. And it, I mean, do you sometimes wonder about the value? Yeah, but I think uh, when James mentions Rio, uh, Ferdinand, it's a good example of an account where um, I think if, if, if athletes just tweet about uh, training or, or kind of corporate stuff on behalf of the club or their league or governing body, it can start to feel quite too much on message. And I think one of the things that Rio has been brilliant with Rio's account is he, he'll talk about football and he'll advocate Harry Redknapp for the England job. But in the next tweet, he's talking about the school run. Uh, and I've just dropped the kids off at school. And, and I think, as James says, it's just personalised him so much and has helped his profile and his, his personal brand because it's made him uh, a kind of, he seems like a rounded individual. And for the first time, uh, it can really bring, it's connected people. So it has brought fans to, I mean, it's, you know, you look, you look at the uh, uh, Zach and Mark. Uh, winning in Beijing, uh, and it was 
the idea then, uh, four, you know, four years ago in Beijing, that fans could have travelled with these guys on the road to an Olympics and really kind of lived that experience with them, uh, is, you know, you just wouldn't have imagined that, uh, much less four years before that in Athens for Gale. So it, it's completely opened up these guys' lives. And, yeah, sometimes that does involve training, but sometimes it involves red wine sauce or whatever that was. Uh, and I think it's just made them into, like, much more rounded people in, in their public profiles, which is a good thing. OK. Let me just ask James, though, that I mean, the BBC, we know, is a fine and wise organisation, but you've now been stopped breaking news stories on Twitter, is that right? <laughs> no, that, that's definitely not right, um, I don't, as you well know, really. I, 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 I do break a lot of stories on Twitter. Well, Rob Harris is in the room, in front, AP in the front row, so he breaks more than me, I'm sure. I don't want to be boasting here. But, I mean, if I, a lot of stories I break on Twitter, which wouldn't necessarily be broken on Five Live or the Six O'Clock News, um, if I have an exclusive that Red, the Rednaps going to be appointed the England manager, um, I probably, and that's five past six, I probably would get in a bit of trouble with my bosses if I, I don't tell them until ten past six, and I've broken it on Twitter at, at five past six, because clearly that's a, a, a massive story. Um, there are a lot of other stories, uh, sort of, I wouldn't quite call them tittle-tattle, but I level up from that, which are, are good Twitter stories, which aren't necessarily going to go a, a vast amount further. I, I think the problem that we all have, and any, anyone who, who denies this is, is kidding themselves, really. Everybody who uses Twitter ha has the, the ego in them, that, um, which Charles Van Comeny was, was referring to, and everyone is looking at their Twitter followers. And if you do know that Harry Redknapp's got the next England manager's job, you know that if you put that on Twitter, you're going to gain 5,000 followers in about two minutes. And so there is that enormous temptation to put it out on, on Twitter first. And anyone who denies that is, is lying through their teeth. Um, I would like to think when I get that exclusive, I'll be ringing my bosses first. But I think there's every chance I'll be typing on Twitter while I'm talking on, on the phone to them at the same time. I mean, let me just pull that part a bit, because we, so we've got Rob here and, and you know, subscribing to lots of people who are breaking stories on sport. Yeah. I mean, Twitter does fuel this competition about who's got most followers, yeah. and when a story breaks, everybody wants to pile in there. Yeah. So are you saying that you only would file a less important story on Twitter and a more important one goes on TV or radio? That's what I tell my bosses, Roger, including you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the truth is that um, the Twitter will be, it will be tweeted very, very quickly, if not as soon as the phone call was made. Yes, I mean, every, if you have a story which you... If I think Rob's going to put Redknapp getting a job in 30 seconds' time, um, I'm going to be tweeting that pretty quickly. I'm not going to really want to um, delay if I'm giving the honest answer. So, but no one in the BBC simply sat me down and said, you mustn't do it. You do, it's, it everyone's got to be sensible. And of course, if the 6 o'clock news is on air, well, you've, you've got to get a big story out quickly. But um, as long as Twitter doesn't come five minutes before everywhere else, I think hopefully everyone, everyone's happy. Okay. I mean, Gail, you, you've moved from being an athlete to being on the media side of things. I mean, do you think it's making life more complicated for athletes now, the fact that you've got all these different ways of communicating? Was it simpler in your day when you just gave an interview to Barry Davis afterwards? I think it's made more, it more complicated for athletes. Um, before, it was you just did your thing and you had the various media days and you got your interviews out and that was it. You're left to your own devices. But now there is that temptation to look at who's following you, put out you know, occasional comments, see what other people are commenting about you, and is that temptation reacting to it? You know, you're in this bubble, and, um, you know, you put something out, could be quite innocent, but someone, you know, takes it in a different way, and suddenly you're under scrutiny for it. So I think it makes it a hell of a lot complicated, and it's something, you know, uh, an added, it should be, you know, well, it should be a fun thing for athletes to do and to write about and just, you know, again, make them more personable to, to people. But, um, you know, it can go the other way. So it's an added, um, I'd say it's an added pressure for them. But when, I mean, when you were competing in Athens uh, and Beijing, um, generally speaking, the public could not get to you to say what they thought of your performance. Whereas now, if you're in London 2012, they can say, you know, rubbish performance tonight, and that goes direct to you. So is that hurtful? Yeah, it is. And, you know, before, before Athens, I remember reading some internet forum and, you know, someone was slating my badminton performance. And it was just, you know, it's very, very hurtful, but it was just one person, this one site that I, I looked at. Now it comes from everywhere. It can come on Facebook, it can come on Twitter. You know, you can't escape it. Um, you know, all I had to do in Athens and Beijing was literally just turn my phone off and just live in the Olympic bubble. But now you're very, very aware and all these temptations of, oh, I'll just check this, oh, I'll just check that, oh, what about that? And so, yeah, it's, it's going to be very, very hard for athletes just to try and disengage from that and uh, focus on their, on their performance. Now, uh, we talked a bit about BBC guidelines. I mean, Zach and Mark, you've got 
BOA guidelines and Team GB guidelines. And as, as I understand it, I mean, one of the things they're worried about is that you potentially disclose more information to your competitors than the team would want. And, and I mean, I, 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 I've, I've stopped teasing now with the things I've found, but I mean, for instance, um, Zach, you, you said one day, no testing today, just waits and home, I'm shattered today, phew. Is that the kind of thing that potentially the Chinese think, ha ha, he's tired today, or is that what people are worried about? Well, to be honest with you, we're athletes, we're going to be tired. It's, it's pretty much common sense. And I'm, as far as I can tell, the, the BOA guidelines that have come out have basically just said, use your common sense and please try and use good grammar. I know with Twitter you try and shorten it down to 140 <laughs> characters as much as possible. Uh, but as long as, they, as long as you put out something that is personal, and it, it kind of goes back to what Mark was saying a little bit as well, that you know, we don't really want to tweet too much about what we're doing in terms of a, a professional working environment in terms of our sport because actually it's the same every single day and if we tweeted the same thing every day we would, as James was saying, have no followers. Um, or maybe the two that hadn't managed to find the unfollow button. Um, so you know, we try and keep our tweets a little bit more personal and a bit more about what we are doing as, as individuals. And then that makes it a lot less um, volatile for people like the, the BOA to, uh, to, get, to get a bit of a, a, a tip about. So. And Mark, is there a, an, an upside to what we're saying about people can get to you direct and be critical, but equally in the home games, do you think it might bore you up? Do you, do you actually want people to interact with you? I think that's a choice every athlete will make when the games comes, whether they respond to those comments or react on them. Um, I'm quite looking forward to it. You know, it's going to be interesting to see what people think. And, you know, you, you're an athlete, you're strong minded, you're there to perform. You've got to take the rough with the smooth, and people are going to criticise you. They're going to say nice things, but at the end of the day, you just get on with your job and get on with it. And if you want to react to it, it's entirely up to you. Um, I don't see it being a negative thing, because at the end of the day, you're going to have to perform, and whoever's going to kind of say nasty things behind the scenes, are just you can avoid them at all costs. You can unfollow them or get rid of them. Pretty much, it's entirely up to you. And Lewis, in terms of the way it changes um, broadcasting, I mean, we talk sometimes about TV being the dominant medium, which it still is. But is TV now being changed by social media? And how much does social media start interacting with mainstream BBC One, BBC Three? I think, yeah, the answer definitely yes. I mean, I think social media has changed TV. I think social media has changed the whole of the media, the whole of the industry, um, and mostly, uh, almost entirely in a positive way. Uh, I mean, what we're seeing, <clears throat> rather than uh, social media killing off TV, is that it's actually complementing TV uh, really well, so it's becoming the second screen experience. Uh, most of you will know now that you, ca you can't watch mainstream, uh, kind of like, you know, big time TV, because appointment to watch TV without your laptop or your phone next to you, uh, to use Twitter and kind of like talk to the people who are other people that are watching the show, using the same hashtag. Certainly around sporting events, we're finding that. Um, I think the next step after that is to incorporate social media into broadcast. So we're going to try and do some of that around the Olympics. More, more to follow on, more detail to follow on that later. Um, but definitely, it's complemented it. It's enhanced it, um, and it's, it's definitely changing it. And you know, I mean, this, on this panel last year, Jake was talking about um, how he's changed F1 running orders uh, in, a, in a kind of live environment based on tweets that he's seeing come through. I'm sure that James has, uh, has kind of responded in a different way, kind of you know, in terms of chasing stories to, to things as they've come on air. So, uh, and obviously, you've heard from the athletes as well. So, but definitely. Second, I mean, th there are roughly 45 million people in the UK who will watch the Olympic Games live on TV. I think the total UK audience for Twitter is about six million. So, so why should the influence of a very small minority of a minority influence what's on BBC One? Well, I think um, we, we have a choice. So in terms of the people that are uh, watching uh, TV who are already users of social media, uh, it can enhance their viewing experience, definitely. In terms of people that are not yet using social media, uh, they may well find that uh, what they're seeing on, when they see social media on screen, that it's encouraging them to use social media platforms, and that will uh, further enhance their viewing experience if they're not doing that already. Uh, just being, you know, Part of the reason why people traditionally watch football in pubs is, I think, because they wanted to be part of a community and to experience an event with other, other like-minded people. Um, social media just opens up the whole world for that, uh, and everyone can enjoy an experience together. So in, I don't think it necessarily has to change uh, what's on BBC One. I definitely think it can enhance it. Uh, I mean, we've traditionally put you know, callers on radio shows uh, to kind of like, you know, represent uh, a fan who might represent his club by ringing Five Live in, in the evening. Um, I mean, that's just one individual, right? So I think it's definitely more reflective than that. Uh, and, and it can in, kind of enhance that, 
the show but making it feel more interactive with its audience. People will give stories. I mean, the, for example, I'll give you one, one example. The, the story we did that the London 2012 had oversold the synchronised swimming by 10,000 seats. That story came from Twitter. People tweeting me who had been asked to give back their, their synchronised swimming tickets. Now, those people who were tweeting might not have bothered to pick up the phone and run five live or somebody, but one tweet, and suddenly you know, there's their stories on the news. So uh, it gives the, the people out there who are going to the Olympics much more power if they see something which they think is newsworthy. We could be reporting it within, within half an hour if it's a good story. OK, um, we're going to bring questions in in sort of 10 or 15 minutes, but I just want to do a quick straw poll on this. Um, if we could, do you want to see postings from Twitter and Facebook and comments from the audience on BBC One in live Olympic Games coverage. Can you show your hands if you would like to see that? And can you show your hands if you wouldn't like to see that? Which is a majority saying they wouldn't like to see that. Uh, James, does that surprise you? Uh, it does slightly, because this is an audience of people who are interested in Twitter. So if the audience here is saying no, then I, I, I am quite surprised, yes. But isn't it partly because um, what we talk in broadcasting jargon about the second screen experience, you like having a second screen experience. You don't necessarily want a one screen experience in which social media and telly merge. Is that it? Lewis? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think we're, we're at the cutting edge of this and we've got to make these decisions. And that was, that was a really interesting straw poll. Um, there, there may well be something there about, uh, as you say, the kind of the second screen staying in the second screen. I mean, I think, I think this is new stuff. And I mean, I think it will grow. Uh, I mean, I think all big me mainstream media has found over the last really sort of uh, last decade or more since the kind of the advent of the web, that, uh, that kind of like one-to-many broadcasting model uh, doesn't necessarily work without a certain level of interactivity. So it may just be that we've not quite got there yet on that, but um, it'd be interesting, to, you know, it'd be interesting to see once we get to the summer. Okay. Now, with, with the athletes now, um, I, I don't want to ask unfair questions about Team GB guidelines, but I, I was looking up today uh, LOCOG's guidelines to games makers, and I dare say we have some volunteers and people who are going to be games makers here, and they've been told um, uh, uh, what to do and what not to do, and it says that on social media, you must not disclose your location, you must not post a picture or video of LOCOG backstage areas close to the public, you must not disclose breaking news about an athlete, you must not tell a social network about a, visit a visiting VIP, for example, an athlete, a celebrity, or a dignitary, and you're not to get involved in detailed discussion about the games online. However, in a major bit of liberalisation, you can retweet or pass on official London 2012 postings. <laughs> um, Zach, do you think that's realistic? I think it's a really difficult one to get into because there is, you know, there's a huge amount of security involved at the games. And Obviously, if, if, you know, if, you, if you suddenly find out if you're backstage at one of the events and you suddenly find out a royal is coming to visit and you stick it on Twitter, they're going to have a massive, massive problem with security and making sure they're keeping the area tied down. So there's definitely some relevance with, the, with those guidelines. But it comes back to a bit of common sense because if you're there to try and help and support the games and try and make sure it runs smoothly, then one of the reasons that you're, one of the ways you're going to be contributing to that is, is to make sure that things are very easy to do for everybody else who's working there. And if you're suddenly causing a massive security issue by tweeting there's a royal, a royal turning up, then that's not really doing your job properly. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be about sharing the atmosphere, yes, sharing the enjoyment of it, sharing things that are going on that, that sort of are interesting but not directly, directly massively important to what's going on, and, and just generally sharing that Olympic spirit that, that everyone keeps going on about, and, and that's going to be what, what the Games is all about. And Mark, if, 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 when you're um, preparing for a race, presumably the last thing you want is a volunteer taking pictures, uploading it, tweeting about what you're up to. Yeah, definitely, but when you're kind of preparing for an event, you wouldn't put yourself in a situation where people can see you. You normally kind of hide away somewhere, um, relax and chill out with your headphones on um, and people who will be around Thorny when we're, we're competing are mostly going to be people that come from rowing clubs in the UK and they understand that you know an athlete preparing to go out and perform they don't want to kind of you know inhibit your performance by being silly running up to you taking pictures or asking you to sign something so they pretty much have a mutual respect for you as an athlete so I don't think that'd be a problem. Now, Gail, obviously you, you've been on both sides of the fence, but if you did see Usain Bolt having an interesting conversation with someone, would you be tempted to tweet it? 
No, I, I don't think I will, because obviously I, I know I've been in that situation, so I know what it's like, exactly what Mark was talking about. If you, you're out there to compete in Olympic Games, there, you've got to give the guys the best chance to go out there and perform. So, yes, if I see something and I know it's going to cause you know, a breaking story and people are going to come out from, you know, from anywhere just to get a photo or something like that, and I'm going to cause you know, a scene, then it's not the thing to do. You're there to help the Games you know, be the best they can be. And that my role will be as broadcaster, my bosses are the BBC. I'm not going to try and do anything, you know, stupid. I, like, I quite like to be part of the Olympics. I don't really want to uh, be sent home packing because of something stupid I've done and got carried away with it. And like I say, you know, I, I know what it's going to be like in that situation. I want those guys to be the best they can be. So, James, if, if, if a volunteer tweets that they've seen an athlete being injured... Are you not going to use that because that's not what they should be doing? The problem we're going to have is it's trying to verify information because Twitter is going to give us so many different leads which we've never had before at an Olympics and probably 30% is going to be complete nonsense. So trying to sift through what is true and not go off on a wild goose chase is going to be a real challenge for us. I mean, on Twitter this morning we had the, the European Swimming Championships have been moved to London by 10 o'clock this morning. By midday they were being staged in Hungary. So. I mean, there, there is, there's going to be an awful lot of nonsense talk, and it is going to probably waste a lot of time, and that, that, that is going to be one of the hardest things for us as journalists to deal with. But having said that, there is obviously Twitter is a news source which we've never had before at the Olympics, and so the, the benefits are going to far outweigh the minuses for us. And how do you, how do you verify a story like, like an, ath, an, in, an injured athlete? How do you... How do you you only go to the official team, or...? Well, you, you, yes. I mean, in, in theory, if someone tips you off that Usain Bolt had been seen on crutches, you, you, you then ring the Jamaican Association or, or whoever. But it, those stories are going to be hard to verify when we're mainly outside the village, and those kind of stories are going to come from within. So if, if there are, are genuine moles who are tweeting from the village, um, we'll need to try and verify them pretty quickly. And if, if we believe that they're, they're true, they're going to be getting on, our, getting on air a, a fair amount during the Games. And, and Mark and Zach, do you see the media as uh, your friend in these circumstances or as hostile, is that? I th I th we've become very good at, and I hate to say it, but controlling the media when we're competing. Um, it's entirely up to us when we want to be spoken to. Um, in Beijing, we avoided talking to the media after our semi-final so we could prepare for our final. And it is just about an athlete just being sensible and just taking control and not being controlled. I think that's really important. I think, okay. I think, it's, sorry, I think it's also about being honest because if you... If you are, you know, if you make it very aware that, that there will be the opportunity to interact with the athletes, then then it is fair enough to say, okay, look, hold on, give us 24 hours. We'll talk to you this time tomorrow. But right now, we've got a bit of a job to do, and there'll be a much bigger story to report on tomorrow if you just give us a space now. And Gail, do you think that um, people in the media who have been athletes are inherently more sympathetic than you know people like James who just want to kind of stir up a news story? Um, yes, and I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, you know, it's it's very hard now in in, in the media circles and um, in local uh, media. I'm doing at the moment. Um, you know, they're all getting very excited about the ones to watch. Oh, let's go and interview this person. Let's go and interview that person. And I'm trying to say, you're no, no, leave them, leave them alone. They're preparing for the biggest event of their lives. Let's just give them some space. You know, let's work it in a way that we can help. They do. You know, it's. It's trying to explain, and it can be very hard to explain to media when you know they, look, they really don't want to do it. They're stressed out. They, this competition hasn't gone too good. Just leave them be and let them, you know, just let them know that we're here. And when when's good for them to talk to us? Then you know it's about being honest and having a really good, um, really good communication, really good relationship with the athlete media. Which are, you know, if you have that, then you're going to get the interviews. You're going to get that respect with each other and the, and uh, get the the stuff that. But that's going to help both parties. But if you're just constantly in their face trying to get this because, you know, everyone's really excited about it, it's not going to work out that way. OK, I'm really interested in questions from the audience. So uh, I don't know if there's anything immediate from uh, anyone here. Anyone want to go first with a question? It's apparently someone. God, no? we, don't, we don't bite, promise. Anyone? Your chance to talk to a gold medalist or... So, right, OK, at the back there. So, Nick. Hello, Nick Newman. Um, I'm interested in um, the athlete's perspective of whether um, you feel you can uh, deal with this issue of scale. So one person and you've got all these people with the feedback loop. To what extent do you think you need sort of something like a producer to help you filter that 
or help you deal with the new multimedia tools as social media develops going forward? Do you think you need somebody, or does that reduce the authenticity of the whole thing? I think, I think, yeah, I think the, the, one of the joys of Twitter is its authenticity and, and the similar things with, with Facebook as well, to a, but to a slightly lesser extent. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the reasons that it has taken off so much in, a, in the sporting environment and, and with other, other sort of high profile people is the fact that it, it comes directly from the horse's mouth. You know, it, it is the person on, who's sending the tweet saying it and that, that, ha that is what really sparks its authenticity and, and the enjoyment that people get out of it. I think if you... If you try and, as you say, filter it or, or put it through a, you know, some, someone else writing, third, a third party writing the tweet, then that removes instantly the personal approach and the, sort of the, the really nice intimate touch that you get with it. Um, I'm just reading some of the tweets coming through. I mean, someone's said here, integrating social media into broadcast TV smacks of asinine scrolling shout outs on late night junk telly shudder. So thank you, Simon Everest, for that. Um, <laughs> Mark, do you think you want to add on, on the point that uh, Nick asked. Um, I, I think as an athlete, it's just it's common sense, really, isn't it? You know, it's what you want to tell people. Um, and I, I think, yeah, if you did have a second party kind of filtering things through it, it'd make it pretty boring. You know, that wouldn't be interesting to anyone. So I think coming, as Zach said, from the horse's mouth is a lot more enjoyable for us. And it's actually our point of view that's going out. More questions, please. Um, Rob. He's a journalist, by the way. <laughs> Since James mentioned me, it's um, uh, Rob Harris from Associated Press. Um, a lot of people talk about how journalists sort of cover athletes on Twitter or mention them or uncover stories. H how much of a fear is it, you know, particularly in the head of the Olympics, that a member of sort of Joe Public spots you out and about having a few beers, up to something, takes a picture of you, posts that on Twitter, and, uh, and it, you know, it's actually a member of the public who might expose something rather than a journalist? We're rowers, no one knows who we are. <laughs> <laughs> We're not footballers, so it's never going to happen. Uh, and to be honest, like, we don't really go out drinking like that, so uh, you'd never see us in that kind of light um, at an event. There was one quite recently, wasn't there, where the team was out partying. You'd never see rowers doing that because you know, we're professional in the way we perform and want to be seen from the outside. So, but I understand like, if we were out in a bar having dinner, you know, might have a glass of wine or there'd be a beer there. Yeah, someone could take a picture, but um, that's just something you have to deal with. I don't think you can really stop that happening. I mean, it's a point now that actually you can't control this. That's the point. And then, I mean, in the end, social media breaks down all the traditional barriers. So actually, everything's fair game. You can't control people's opinions, no. But you can control situations that you put yourself in. You know, and up and coming, you wouldn't, like Mark said, you would not put yourself at a party with a few beers out at two in the morning when you were training because you just wouldn't do that. You can't, you know, you can control that. You can't control people's opinions, and that's what social media is, is great because you get a wide range of opinions. But, yeah, you can, there's some things you can control. I think the biggest worry, I think, um, from an athlete, it's not about members of public seeing it. I think it's friends and family, innocent you know, sort of remarks. I think that's because they're close to you, very, and um, you know, sort of just mentioning a little thing here. They're the ones that I think it's really important for the athletes to say, you know, mom, dad. You know, you're new to. You know, they might be all excited because they're on Twitter and might put something totally innocent on a remark. And actually, it's the people that are closest to, you know, the athletes. They're the ones that really need to just, you know, maybe lay off uh, a little bit beforehand. More questions, please. Obviously Just wait for my train. Sorry. There's the whole uh, aspect of betting and getting information in a, to help you win your bet, as it were. Do you think this is going to play a part? I'm not a gambling man, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's, it's, you know, things that come out, you know, your, your mum and... you. Know, people you know around you close just putting in a certain mask and then you know sort of bets just social media you know sort of people's opinions isn't it and then oh it's oh, i don't know what i'm trying to say here um yeah it's very scary to about the betting i think it's a very very scary part of 2012 and again you know this is why you've got to make sure that you know if you have got a slight injury or you know you know something about another person you've got to be careful about what you put out because of course then you can you know maybe other people might bet on someone oh you know you know what i mean yeah. i'm not explaining myself very well but yeah I mean, Gail, do, do you know athletes who absolutely will not do 
Facebook or Twitter or any social media because they just think, hey, you know, I have a right to a private life. I'm not going to expose everything I want to think about or talk about or pictures to the world. I don't know any, no, not in the Bavinson world, I don't know anyone who's not in a Facebook or a Twitter situation. You know, they are, they're, they're that age, they're that generation. You know, maybe it's sort of when we were playing, you know, there was a few of us that weren't on Facebook and, you know, we've just started getting into it, just went around Beijing time, oh, Facebook, this is interesting. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's just this generation now. You know, the athletes now are, you know, 17 to 28, 29, rough age, 30, 31, 32, 33. How old are you? <laughs> Two old three. <laughs> so yeah, it's a generation. You know, that's what they're they're used to. They've grown up on it. So. Th th and Mark, they are. Do, you, do you know anybody who doesn't? Do this yeah, stuff? we've we've got a couple in the rowing team that uh, don't go on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, they're very private people. Who like to come and do their job, come to work, train, and then leave, and don't like to get involved in anything like that. Um, a lot of the team have actually just come on Twitter in the last six months. To be honest, they've started to understand what it's about, and trying to build profiles and kind of network with people outside and seeing the benefits in that. So, you know, it has the team dramatically has changed with the people, you know, getting involved in Twitter and posting things up. Uh, the heavyweight men have got into it quite a lot. Uh, there's a lot of banter between them and between athletes and that sort of thing. And it is a lot of fun. You know, we see it as fun. We don't see it as a chore or anything wrong with it. I think those athletes who are accessible on Twitter and particularly accessible to the media on Twitter will gain. I think um, the fact of life is it's a competitive business for you guys. There were 19 gold medals in Beijing. I mean, fingers crossed it'll be the same kind of total in London. Uh, there, are some, there are some gold medalists. I won't ask examples now because I'm fair enough, but there are some gold medalists who people here in this room on the whole haven't heard of from Beijing. Um, certainly one or two of the sailors, for example. And it, it is tough to, to, to have a, a good profile. And if you want a gold medal, you deserve a good profile and the, the trappings that, that, that come with that. So I think the media certainly, uh, and I know Zach partly through Twitter, and I think the media are much more inclined to interview people and, and give them the profile of people who we know and, and interact with on Twitter. So I'm sure in the, the long run you will have benefits from it. Gail said it was an age thing, which I, I'm sure it is. I, is it also an ego thing? Uh, because, you know, if you are a great sportsman or woman, you like performing, you also want your ego out there as well? Zach? <laughs> I'm really proud of what I do. I don't, I don't beat about the bush and I really, really enjoy going out there and race and, and yeah, I get a huge kick out of winning. Um, so, and, and I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to be able to turn around and say, you know what, I won today and thank you, I, I really enjoyed it. So I, I don't see any problem with that That's at all. That's your job, you're going to get sponsorship by having a higher profile, so it's in your interest anyway to... to well, it's, 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 it's my, it's not, it's not necessarily a job, I see it as a sort of a, yeah. a thing I'm really proud to go, be able to go and do. I don't, I don't necessarily, necessarily see it as waking up in the morning and, you know, going to work, I see it as looking, looking out there and going to win that Olympic yeah, gold medal. Your bills. And the, the, more, the, the, more, the higher your profile, it, the, the more bills in, you can in, pay Indirectly, for. yes, yeah. but it's not, it's not why I do it at all. It, it, I, do, I do what I do because I love winning, and I love being able to share that with people, and Twitter is one of the best ways I can share it with the most people at the same time. Yeah. I, I, I was just going to ask yeah. Lewis, actually, because the thing, of course, at Twitter, where you're going to be employed soon, <laughs> does brilliantly, is the whole thing about followers is about boosting egos, isn't it? That you feel more confident and successful if you've got 50,000 followers than if you've got 300. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is, the, you know, there is that, it, there's that model to it. I mean, I was just going to say on the previous point that, um, uh, you know, I think that it's about relationships, right? And, you know, James made the point that he kind of met Zach through, through Twitter. I mean, every, every one of us here kind of knows each other. Sounds at least. like a dating agency. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but every one of us on the panel knows each other, at least in part, through Twitter. I mean, we, we've had kind of like offline uh, relation, working relationships as well. Uh, but, um, but, but that's where, the, you know, uh, so I started chatting to Mark about um, the NFL and American football because we both share an interest in that. Uh, we both support uh, the five-time world champion San Francisco 49ers, uh, the greatest franchise in world sports. Uh, but we, so we've, uh, we, we started chatting about that uh, on there. And so you do, you build, and I think that that level of trust, I mean, we talked earlier about kind of like journalists waiting for athletes to sort of slip up. But actually, you know, that it can work the other way in terms of, uh, you know, all of us kind of getting to know each other as, as real genuine humans and kind of trusting each other and building relationships on there, so. More questions, please. Uh, yes, gentlemen at the back. Hi, uh, Jake Sargent from Pitch. You kind of talked about it a little bit in terms of endorsement around things like Nespresso or Bjorn Borg, but I just wondered in the, in the wake of the recent um, Rio stuff that he did with Snickers and the flack that he got for not being upfront about the fact that they were actually paid for tweets. I'd be interested to get the panel's views on 
uh, whether people should be forced to put spawn in, within tweets that are paid for and how enforceable that is? Um, I've had a few um, sort of contracts and um, for various sponsorship and in, in the contract is that I will tweet you know, regularly about a, um, a, you know, or about the event or about a, a, um, a product. So um, I think that, yes, you know, if, it, if it's so blatant, you know, if it's so blatant, it is obvious, then yes, I think you should put um, that it, this is a sponsored tweet. But, you know, you, you can do it in, 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 a, in a very, if you, oh, I'm babbling, aren't I? Um, if you do it in the right way, you use your common sense, then it's absolutely fine. And I don't think you need to like put stars and flashes. This is a sponsored tweet, but you can do it in the in the right way. It's just you know, as long as you're not just constantly throwing these tweets in people's faces, because then people people don't want to know that, and people people just you know guess it and and see straight through it. So you don't want to do that either. It's just about common sense, but in the right way, right context. And then I think you know there's absolutely no problem with them um, you know sort of endorsing. I think it's also really important to appreciate that sport is becoming more and more business orientated and to be able to produce the sort of results that we do as a country, it's really, really important to, to recognise the fact that we are supported by a number of different organisations. Um, one of the ways that, that that support can be shown is, is through social media and getting um, mentions or whatever through, through via our supporters or about our supporters is one of the ways we can do it. And I think, as Gail, Gail said, as long as not every single tweet is about um, about your sponsors, then fine, have a bit of balance and, and also share the fact that, that you are grateful for the support they give you through the social media work. Do you really like Whisper? <laughs> I do actually genuinely like chocolate, <laughs> generally. Um, I haven't come across any other um, green and blacks, I don't know, do they have a, do they have a Twitter account I should search? <laughs> okay. I just saw um, a comment go through from um, at Jake Sargent saying that 95% of the audience here thought there shouldn't be uh, social media interaction on BBC One. So you could decide whether you think it was 95% or a bit different from that, but uh, uh, the social media never lies, as we discovered tonight. Um, more questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, uh, there's a lady, uh, gentleman there and a lady there. Yeah. I'm definitely not a lady. Um, hi, it's Ian Stafford here. Uh, Gail, apart from asking whether you've brought that lemon drizzle cake you were tweeting about last night here, you have. I've got one bit left. Do you Fantastic. want Fantastic. Yes, please. Thank you. Anyway, um, more importantly, or perhaps less importantly, um, I just wondering, you were talking, Zach and Mark as well, about uh, common sense, and the last thing you want is for your stuff to be policed. But we all know there's not a week that passes without a sports, sports person, normally a footballer, who drops himself in the proverbial. So how do we get around this, 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 this problem? Because it, sometimes it's, it's just a genuine mistake, and they're mortified when they realise what they've done. So where's the balance between policing and not policing? I think it's through not, not just guidelines and suggestions and sort of education, but it, it's, it's just down to sort of making people aware of where that boundary is. Because I think some, so there's some of the reasons people fall into that, into that proverbial, as you so delicately put it, is, um, is that they don't know or they don't, don't realise what they're saying is, is wrong. I think as long as you write a tweet, read it and think, what are going to be the consequences of that, and then think, okay, that's okay to send, and send it, rather than, you know, if you are out at two o'clock in the morning, and you have had a few glasses of uh, lemonade, um, then you tweet something, and you might not actually be realising you're tweeting it, and that will be where you end up in... in just before we lose it, just breaking news, Team GB has tweeted, Twitter allows us to bridge the gap between the athletes and the public, helping to galvanise the nation's support for our greatest team. Here so, here. endorsement from Team GB on that, anyway. Um, anyone else want to pick up the end of that question about control? I mean, Mark, have you deleted tweets that you think were unwise afterwards or not? Yeah, there's been times when you're, you're kind of seeing another athlete or something tweet something, and you know, the, the, the thing that really annoys me when it's involving um, banned athletes, I see tweets like that, and straight away you want to react on it and say, you know, they should be thrown out of sport forever, not allowed to compete, end of. Um, but you kind of you start writing the tweet and then you realise actually this could go the wrong way. So you delete it and then don't do it. So I normally sometimes write the tweet, give it a couple of minutes, think about it. If it's not such a good idea and I've kind of come to a conclusion, then I'll delete it before I actually post it. I think that's really wise. So it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's taken those yeah. couple of minutes to think about the consequences of what you're about to write. Um, the lady in the middle there who's next to the microphone. Uh, I'm just going to ask a quick question from the back here. I've been waiting. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. Um, 
I, so I'm just trying to understand. I know there's a lot of focus on the, the sportsmen here, but I'm more focused on what the BBC is going to be doing. Because from my understanding and your question about how many people in the room want to see Twitter and such with the BBC, are you, I mean, do you have any policy that you're going to... Are you going to publish stuff on Facebook? Are you going to interact in that way? Is, or are you just going to carry on being the BBC? Well, I, I think, Sorry. I think I'll, I'll, I'll partly answer this. I think we, we do... You know, a lot of us in the BBC love social media, and in fact, it gives you audience interaction. And in the old days, you used to get um, what was called the duty log, which was a list of the phone calls that people had made about your programmes from about 24 hours previously. Whereas now, you get real-time, constant comment going through, and that does genuinely influence you. I think the key thing is, is don't think it's everybody in the audience; it's part of the audience. But I think for, for, for 2012, on BBC Three especially, I think we're going to look at social media playing a role within BBC Three. You know, my personal view, do I want lots of tweets around the 100 metres final on BBC One? Probably not. So I'm probably with the majority of the, of the room here on that. But um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good point. Does anyone, I mean, Lewis, do you want to? Can I just to add to, to that? Um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, partly my job will be to try and convince Roger to do some of this stuff. Uh, uh, but in terms of what we'll do around social media to, to answer the question, uh, I mean, we've, we've, we've always been in that space. Um, we were the first European broadcaster to incorporate tweets into our site, which we were doing as far back as 07, uh, when we had two reporters going around France for the Rugby World Cup, and we put them on Twitter, and we had those live tweets being pumped into our site. Um, we, we, we use Twitter as a news-gathering tool. Uh, we're, you know, we're a content company, and we're about content, and we're about making that content as av available to as wide an audience as possible, and we're, we want to be interactive with, with our audiences as well. So these platforms for us are news-gathering tools. They're, they're ways of... Uh, correspondence in the field like James breaking news but they're also ways of getting news in uh, so every news editor uh, in B everyone in a news editor position in BBC Sport it's a completely non-negotiable rule that they have to have a Twitter account in which to follow not necessarily to tweet we want people like James to be tweeting but we want all of our news editors to be following the key people like Mark and Zach and Gail and others uh, athletes and others um, so yeah we're using it as a news gathering tool to uh, to bring in we're using it to publish uh, and, we, and we're using it to interact with our audience as well so we've been, we've been there for a long time and, and it'll definitely be a key part of what and we do for the Olympics. I would just say other social media platforms are available. Um, I was going to say, well, it's, say quickly as well, there, there was, there are, it's easy to say just put Twitter on BBC One, for example, yeah. but um, there are issues. I mean, our, our Twitter feed, my Twitter feed now goes onto the, the BBC website. During the Harry Redknapp trial, my Twitter was going straight onto the BBC website. Uh, anyone who, who followed that trial will know that there was, um, there was an interview Harry Redknapp did with the News of the World, which is the heart of the case, which was played in court. Uh, he likes his effing and blinding, does our Harry. And, um, and I was just tweeting uh, what Harry was saying. Now, I just put F dot dot dot, but I was, tweet I was, you know, I was still tweeting the, the F words. Well, I then got a text from one of Lewis's colleagues at the BBC website saying, stop, stop, this is all going on the website. You know, we can't, we can't have this going on the front page of the BBC website. So there are, you, you, you can't just put one, one to the other. What was perfectly fine for Twitter might not be fine for BBC One at, at five o'clock in the afternoon during the 100 metres final. And it's just worth saying, I, I quoted the figure earlier of six million audience for Twitter in the UK. I think Facebook's around about 26 million. Um, so, so Facebook is still absolutely huge, and especially in terms of exchanging video and people um, pointing to, um, to content. Um, I'm definitely going to bring that lady in there because she's been waiting for a bit. Thanks. Just a, a point about interaction, really. I'm interested in the athletes and their policy on blocking. Um, you know, unlike most of us, you were presumably spending time with uh, sports psychologists to put you in the winning frame of mind, tell you you're brilliant, and how you feel about your work can materially affect your performance, whereas, you know, somebody says something critical to me, it might ruin my morning, but it's not going to affect my performance. I mean, that, what's your policy on blocking people who are very critical, and um, are you going to, I mean, is there a temptation that your Twitter feed, you know, you withdraw from that interaction and become a sort of news feed, which has its own implications? <laughs> In terms of criticism, I think, you know, certainly, I know for um, Mark and I think myself, we are exceptionally critical of ourselves anyway, and I don't think we'd ever come across anybody who could be more critical of us because we have such high standards. You need those high standards in order to go and win. So if people want to come, on, come along and say something critical, I don't mind it. I have, I have absolutely no problem with someone being critical, as long as it can be constructive or so them, them helping in some way. If someone's just abuse, abusive, then obviously that has a slightly different policy. I don't, I don't have any qualms, but if someone comes along and starts throwing tweets at me saying X, Y, and Z, about saying, you know what, well, I don't want to hear this, I don't need to hear this, it's not helpful, and it's not part of what I want to get out of social media. I want social media to be fun, interesting, and exciting to be taking part in. 
and one of the one of the things about that is is making sure that you can have an honest conversation with someone um, about you know maybe you haven't had a great race or maybe you're not doing such such and such and and explaining why and and thinking about how you can develop that into a positive message uh, rather than someone just saying blah 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 at you and not expecting to have any constructive feedback. I think it's really important to remember it is people's opinions. People are allowed to have their opinions. And, you know, Mark and Zach are very honest and say, you know what, we're critical of ourselves. We can take it. We're, you know, sort of very strong minded people. There are going to be athletes out there that are not like Zach and Mark. And then I think that's important for those people, you know, to maybe slay off Twitter. If they, you know, it is a social media, people are going to have opinions of them. If they can't handle that and, you know, for, if they get down about it, if they can't do that, then the, you know, my advice would be to them is just to just stay away, you know. If it's got to be something, it's got, it's got to be, you've got to see it, that you've got to be able to handle it. If you cannot handle it, if you cannot handle the interaction, and just stay away. And I think it's really important, you know, some people, with the pressure of an Olympics, to have people saying, you know, various bits of stuff. It could be very true. But again, if they can't handle it, I think it's best advised, you know, for the coaches and sports psychologists to say, then stay away. It's not worth it. You've got to focus on the Olympics. I've never blocked anybody on Twitter, but I've got someone, I don't know if anyone else has got them at the moment. Every day I get sent a different verse of the Bible. Is it just me? Maybe it is just me. And I'm, I mean, every day I agonise over whether to block them, but then I think I'm gonna, someone up above is going to like look down on me. And I, I can't, I, I'm in a lose-lose situation, so at the moment they, they remain unblocked. I'll pass them on to you, Lewis. It could do you a little bit. Yeah. We've probably got five to ten minutes left, so uh, question there. Um, the greater your um, profiles are on Twitter, obviously the better it is for your sport. It grows the profile of your sport. Um, do you think that athletes should be on Twitter? Like you were mentioning before about members of your team that have stayed away from it. But what's your opinion on that? I think it's got to be a personal choice. You know, some people want to kind of, you know, get in touch with their fans or people that are following them or are interested in it. And other people just want to be left alone and to get on with their job and not have any interaction. Um, it's just up to the individual and, you know, what sort of person and their personality is, you know, whether they want to, you know, have interactions with people or as I said just be left alone um, I don't think you can make someone go on it because they won't enjoy it and part of the, the Twitter thing we're all in there is because it's fun it's enjoyable to chat and talk about different things if you want to promote the sport that's down to the sport themselves so it's the badminton association or the rowing association then they, they're the ones to promote the sport that's not your job your job is to go out there and perform as an athlete so you know you've got to remember that you're not you're not doing that for them couple of uh, ladies there. Um, mine's probably more of a communications question than anything else. Um, I mean, I, I remember working in radio when fax machines were the cool hip thing, um, and they're now kind of extinct and no one even talks about them anymore. Do you feel that there's going to become a point in the BBC's kind of big ideal where you no longer use telephone or email and it's just these social media platforms, and if you do see that happening, what kind of time scale do you see it? Um, uh, I mean, I, I think the the uh, the, the, the anal uh, may, uh, you know your comparison between social networks and the phone is is an interesting one because you know I, I saw a, a headline uh, there was an interview of Richard Branson recently and, so, and there was some headline about how does he find time to maintain a social you know to be on Twitter and social networks because he's quite prolific on Twitter and it just I just was thinking at the time like would anyone say I wonder how Richard Branson finds time to use the phone right it's just it's just a communication tool and it's it, in some ways a much more efficient and you know, you know easy to use communication tool so. Um, yeah, I mean, will it phase out the phone? I don't, I don't think so, not any not anytime soon. Um, but um, it's definitely, uh, you know, it's definitely become um, and is fast becoming a much more kind of like everyday uh, communication tool than just sort of a publishing thing. I think it's, I think it's both of those things. I'm more. You're never going to turn the phone lines off. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it's entirely within our gift, but no, I don't, I don't see that happening uh, very soon. And you're definitely not old enough to have been working in the fax machine. I think the, the analogy, though, is it's, it's quite interesting that social media thrives actually around big TV events. So you need, you need the Olympics on television to really get social media going, the same way that The X Factor does and Strictly Come Dancing does. And the kind of interesting thing, I suppose, is the way that those big programmes are made bigger by social media, but they still, at the heart of them, have a, have a TV event or a real event, which is 
you know, fascinating mix of old and new, really. The, um, the biggest spikes on social media all come from mainstream TV. But, you know, that's, that's, when, that's, yeah. when, that's when really, really good. Yeah. Time for a couple more questions. Yeah, lady there. Um, I wanted to talk about sort of the darker side of Twitter. So recently, you've obviously had quite key athletes removing themselves from Twitter because of racism. I think Mika Richards is the most recent. And you've also got Joey Barton, who is uh, quite renowned for things he's saying um, very publicly about John Terry and about Fer uh, Ferdinand and so on and so on. Um, obviously, he's now being threatened with contempt of court, or he was being before it was sort of thrown out. So what, I mean, what do you make of that? Because Twitter ultimately is a social media tool, yet there's this much darker side of it where the law is being brought in, police are being brought in, and you know people are getting abused, and so often you hear of athletes dealing with police because of Twitter. What as do you as I, I, I should just say we shouldn't go into any current or former Sorry. court stuff, but I think, I think the darker side question, I don't know, people, Mark, do you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I get that is a darker side, I guess, when those sort of things start happening. And to be honest, that's not really what it's about, is it? You know, you don't go in there to attack people and be horrible and be racist and you know, put those sort of things. But, you know, if people, you know, are that stupid and want to do that, they've got to face the consequences, you know. And I think that is when the police and you know, lawsuits will come in, you know, if you're going to start abusing someone like that. And there is yeah. something about the relative anonymity of social media that people would say things on social media that they'd never say to your face. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's always a problem. You know, people can always hide behind a few texts or messages, but will never say it to someone's face. That's always the problem. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the other side. People can hide behind what they say. And, you know, if they do go out of line, then they should be towed back in line. Okay, gentlemen towards back in the check shirt. Um, increasingly, athletes are using um, Twitter specifically to sort of um, refute claims made by journalists. I wondered if uh, news desk journalists are finding um, pressure to make their reporting more accurate, specifically the tabloid press. Uh, I can't answer on behalf of the tabloid press, but it, um, no, you're right. But in, in a way, though, what's great is you can kind of verify a story with, with somebody now before you even necessarily have to, have to publish it for, through Twitter. So. If there's an Olympic story, I can maybe tweet Zach and ask him if it's true or if I'm barking up the wrong tree. Or even, I mean, Ferdinand gets so many tweets, you know, your chance of getting a, a reply from him are, are small. But certainly to an, another footballer, if there was a, a story about them, at least you could put something to them fairly easy without having to go through, through their agent. So, um, of course, as a journalist, you always want to be telling the truth. Well, certainly as a BBC journalist, you want to be telling the truth anyway. And I think Twitter is, is a benefit because it, it gives us more chance of being able to report what is genuinely the truth. Okay. I, just, I, I was going to say, we're, we're, we're running out of time, so what I want to do to the whole panel is just ask the same question uh, with relatively short answers, and we'll go this way round. But, um, Lewis, how would social media make London 2012 better in a couple of sentences? In a couple of sentences, I think, it, it, like no Olympics before, it has connected uh, fans with athletes, athletes with journalists, journalists with fans. Uh, there's a global conversation which has connected everybody involved in the Olympics to everybody else, and that can only be a good thing. James? Yeah, if I'm lucky enough to be inside the stadium before the 100 metres final, I'll be able to share that experience with thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of people in a way that I couldn't have done bef before the before Twitter existed. Yeah. It just gives that extra bit of more information. It gives that extra experience. And I just think that, you know, for London 2012, it's just going to be fantastic. You're going to, you know, it's almost going to feel more real. I think the, the personal side of things is going to be crucial. I mean, we are, yeah, the Olympics happens every four years and it, it, each Olympics has had a slightly different theme. This one in London is going to be very British, but very intimate, very, very, um, it's going to be, make it a lot smaller in terms of interactions because everybody will know everything all the time and that will just make it that little bit more interesting to watch. Mark? Um, I think, you know, obviously on the kind of Olympic cycle is four years, I think, you know, the followers you have they'll be on that journey with you and it's kind of the icing on the cake to be at the Olympics and be able to share that experience right the way to the end with them. Okay, well listen, um, thank you so much everybody for coming tonight. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the questions on Twitter as well. The most important thing I was going to say for Zach uh, uh, and, and the crew is just have a fantastic Olympics and bring another gold medal back. And do, do you know what a gold medal looks like? Do you have any that you happen to have brought with you? Or? <laughs> Um, 
we would like to see more of those, please. So uh, we'll do our luck. best. Good luck. And thanks to the panel, and thanks to you for coming along.